trust. Yeah. Um, it would be very easy as long as uh, the Bitcoin D development stopped in its tracks and gave us time to just sit back, relax, and figure out how to build it. Because the problem is you can't stop. It's a moving target, right? So every single release introduces new modifications. Uh, and so you need a full-time maintenance team just to keep up. That's why a lot of the altcoins um, aren't very effective or don't have longevity. Uh, you know, you can, you can build Dogecoin as a clone of Litecoin, but Litecoin has Charles Lee working on it all the time, keeping up to you know, zero, uh, zero 0.9 release candidate 2 at the moment. Litecoin is 48 hours behind the head of Bitcoin in terms of code development, um, and no other altcoin is keeping up like that. So, then you, if, you, if you just try to create something, you fall out of date, and then you start running into bugs and problems that have already been solved. It, it's, that's one of the big difficulties with Bitcoin at the moment, is that you have a monoculture. Um, it's a homogeneous system. It has to be, because at the moment, the reference definition of the Bitcoin protocol standard is whatever the hell Bitcoin D does. That's it. That's the documentation. The reference client is the standard. Uh, there is no independent standard, and so every single quirk has to be simulated uh, very, very specifically. It's not unlike the early days of HTML, when in order to implement a web browser, you had to implement Netscape's bugs and Internet Explorer's bugs, and you know little tests to say if this looks like this, then play that bug. And in many cases, it still is. Are there any plans to clean, say, clean up the blockchain or compress it, and basically say, basically say, well, we have all these edge cases in the past, we're just going to determine this is the actual history of transactions. Oh, effectively. And now are we starting with these rules? Every block does that, and essentially the entire development history of Bitcoin D is one big cleanup job. Okay, so it's still. So the easy. assumption is that Satoshi delivered this pristine piece of code, no. right? <laughs> Whereas the reality is more like a cat coughing up a hairball. He went, and then you had that thing, and it worked kind of, but it had bugs like the, the first major bug in 2010, someone was able to create a billion coins in a single Coinbase spend, for example, little bugs yeah. like that. Half the altcoins were insecurely implemented, had to be stripped out immediately. So um, the entire five year history has been a clean of the mess. And, and make it robust. It's getting better all the time, and the more implementations you have. So, for example, one of the best implementations out there right now is the Bitcoin, which is a mere talkies. It's fully multi-threaded, modular, separation of concerns, Unix methodology, um, little modules that talk to each other. It's all really beautifully designed, and it, it's getting close to a full node implementation. It has a full node implementation. You can't really trust it as we do trust yet, but it's getting there. And Bitcoin J is being run in production environments as a root of trust right now. But it's risky. You have to basically stay on top of it because if there's a change in the protocol, you can find yourself in the wrong, on the wrong floor. Yeah. How hard is it to set up one of these verifications? Pretty hard to. To set up a, a full verification? Yeah. Just run Bitcoin, download the full blockchain, and, you, and you keep up with the versions. Which is cool. stay, stay a couple of versions behind. Yeah, so I was talking to him about it, and I was saying that you have to probably bear, you have to buffer it probably for like 20 minutes to get that full blockchain verification. What do you mean by buffer for 20 minutes? Uh, you essentially can't trust what's coming across for 20 minutes if you're like, do I accept this money? Can I really verify it? Well, that's, the, that's a matter of deciding how many confirmations you want before you trust what you're seeing. So, well connected. If you have a node in Bitcoin D that's well connected, meaning it's talking to a diverse set of peers all across the network, um, then you're going to get enough diversity there that you're going to see all possible variations in the blockchain. And then it's just a matter of uh, how many confirmations do you consider good enough. And that depends on what you're doing, right? Because if you're taking in money and then shipping a TV, well, it's not going to ship for 24 hours anyway. Um, you, know, you can't get it out of the warehouse in 10 minutes, it doesn't matter. Selling a house it doesn't matter. 
If you're delivering a digital token, however, it does matter. If you're delivering U.S. dollars on a wire, it does matter. So, so <coughs> or even worse, if you're delivering Bitcoin, um, like in a withdrawal in an exchange, right. and you get the TX malleability wrong, then, then it very much does matter. But it's really a matter of probabilities. How many confirmations are you comfortable with for the amount of money that you're spending? Uh, and you're going to have no blockchain forks all the time. Um, so a single block fork is fairly common. It happens once a day, once every two days. Uh, a two block fork happens once a month. A three block fork sends out a lot of stuff. A 26 block fork happens once. So you could run a web service that actually does the health checking for a larger part of the community? Um, I mean, you no. as a service, if you do something critically and say, is the network healthy? Yes. Is the network healthy? Yes. If no, then I'm not going to acknowledge anything for the Well, essentially, uh, all blockchain info does that, and essentially most, okay. of the, most of the well connected Bitcoin D nodes do that. So, for example, when you first configure Bitcoin D, one of the things you need to do is set up the alert message capability so that it will send you either an emergency broadcast message from the network or a large forward notice. So, if you get more than two block forward, you get an email. And if, okay. Gavin, if Gavin turns on the emergency broadcast system again and says stop, then you get an email. Okay. Uh, that's only being turned on twice, I think, or three times. But there's like a single block for. How much overlap is there between the transactions in the two blocks? Are they completely separate, or the same transactions appear in two two blocks? Do you know? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> It, it depends if there's a single block fork among miners who are using primarily the same strategy for including transactions. Generally speaking, the last 10 minutes will have approximately the last, the same set of transactions. But you have some pools that are mining based on different policies. For example, Allegius mines a lot of non-standard transactions. Very large multi-six, zero fee transactions. Um, they're kind of the anarchists within the anarchist community. They're like, we don't even like your very few rules. <laughs> we'll be buying whatever the hell we want. <laughs> Which is great, actually, because you can get non-standard features for religious, and they're, they're very independent. Uh, but if you have a discrepancy of forms where religious had one block and somebody else had another one, you might have a, quite a big difference in the transaction. It doesn't matter. It only matters in the short term. In the long term, it doesn't matter at all. You just wait until they read the furniture. Anybody else have any questions? By the way, great presentation on the crypto. Sorry, I missed the beginning. That's the thing we've been getting here. But um, another library that you might want to look if you want to see a really compact implementation of Bitcoin fundamental libraries. There's a couple that are really good. Um, and in Python. So um, PyCoin and PyBitcoin tools. Uh, PyCoin is written by Richard Kiss, and PyBitcoin tools is written by Vitalik Buterin. Um, and if you read Py, the source code of PyBitcoin tools, you discover that Vitalik Buterin is a damn genius. <laughs> I mean, um, elliptic curve multiplication in three lines, and I still don't understand what it's doing. <laughs> uh, just beautifully written, extremely compact, some of the most elegant Python I've ever seen, uh, using functional and recursive models and design patterns. Um, very, very compact, very generic. Uh, for example, every function allows you to specify a version prefix, um, all of the commands for encoding to different character sets, like 2-bit, uh, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit numbers, 58, base 58, whatever. Um, they're all variable, so you can you can encode into anything you want. Um, and what it allows you to do is to understand how Bitcoin internals work. Uh, and you can also, because Python is an interactive environment, you can load up an interpreter and then start converting addresses from format to format and seeing what output the function uh, gives you. So it allows you to play around with a lot of the internals that are normally hidden. Like, let me take a, a the thing we were discussing last time, which was uh, addresses, keys, and wallet. 
So take a, a five prefix uh, private wallet import format, private key, uh, uncompressed, uh, base 58 decoded, see what the version of a checksum is. Run the shards to see what the checksum is and validate the checksum. Uh, re-encode it with a different version, see what happens then. Uh, add a zero one on the end, re-encode it as a compressed way of see what happens then. You can play all of these things to see how the internals of each of these libraries work. Um, the entire thing is um, just over four pages long. The Python it's, it's truly astonishing how he does that in four and a half pages.